For the past 365 days, I've been transforming everything in Minecraft to create the ultimate survival world. After more than a year working on this project, we've transformed all of these biomes, and now we've only got the tiger and snowy mountains remaining in the overworld, as well as the nether in the end to transform. Many sleepless nights and hundreds of hours have gone into this video alone. So get ready for the most extreme transformation so far as we head into the tiger in just a moment, because right this second, you've got to just scroll down a little bit from the video and subscribe to the Trixie Blocks and Steph Blocks channels. Not only are we building one of the most insane Minecraft projects ever attempted on the Trixie Blocks channel, but Steph is also creating a fully fledged movie series of the ultimate survival world. And she's just released another episode. So grab your popcorn and get ready for a solid hour of content in the ultimate survival world. So, the tiger biome is one of the most popular biomes in the game, and it features everyone's favourite block type, spruce wood. We're going to combine aspects from the tiger and mega tiger biome to create the most immersive and atmospheric forest possible. To do so, we're going to break up the landscape with some rivers and lakes, and upgrade the trees to add plenty of variation. Of course, we'll add in some custom rocks and bushes to fill out the forest floor, and as an added bonus, create some fallen trees that have been ripped up from the ground. For the theme of the tiger transformation, we're going to be taking lots of inspiration from Viking and Norse mythology to create our own fictional fantasy race, starting by upgrading the tiger's vanilla village. We're going to include a grand feasting hall, various profession buildings suited to the theme of the biome, such as the leathersmith and weaponsmith, a stave church and giant runestones where the citizens can worship, a large war horn to alert the town in the event of an attack, large walls situated between weaponized ballista watchtowers surrounding the entire village, with a network of fire beacons leading through the mountain range to call to aid from its sister village, the Coastal Outpost. And it doesn't end there. The Coastal Outpost will feature a pillager outpost transformation and we'll be turning it into a Viking style lighthouse. We'll have some cliffside housing, an expansive fishing docks across the shore of the island, and Viking inspired longboats venturing across the seas of the USW to distant lands to stir up some trouble or nab some loot. And lastly, hidden deep within the mountain range is the Dragon Training Arena. This was where our Vikings trained and tamed their army of now deceased dragons, and it's going to feature a large round arena, some grandstands from which the village folk observed training, battles, and now sporting events, a watchtower, dragon training platforms to assist the dragon tamers, and lastly, the home of the dragons, their very own nesting cave. Believe me when I say, this is the biggest transformation in the Ultimate Survival World. So I'm not going to keep you waiting anymore, let's get building. To get started with this massive transformation, I obviously had to do some terraforming to make a really epic backdrop for this Viking inspired biome. Luckily, when I created this map with the World Painter, I was able to lay the foundations of a mountainscape, but there was definitely some tweaking required to get things prepared for this village, especially to fit in with everything that we'd planned. And so, the best place for this village seemed to be on the biome border, just on the edge of the tiger and snowy mountains. Vikings actually skied for fun, and they even had a god associated with snow and skiing. So we thought it'd be fitting to give our own clan easy access to the slopes. With the main terraforming complete, it was time to add some rivers and lakes to break things up a bit and make the landscape a little more interesting. So I added some rivers between the mountain peaks and some lakes around the main valley of the biome. Next up, I created a bunch of assets to add to our environment. I built lots of conifer tree variants, as varying the structure, height and materials of the trees really helps to make the environment look more realistic and dynamic. I also built a wide range of boulder variants to scatter around, along with a few fallen trees, which should help to make this world super immersive and fun to explore. And finally, I whipped up some smaller shrubs to dot around, which were the final addition to my little environment asset palette. And so, I place the various tiger assets throughout the biome, and I'm not gonna lie guys, this part is always very tedious. But the results are definitely worth it. I try to add the assets in little clusters, since this is a pretty common sight in the real world, and honestly, it just reminds me of a Bob Ross painting. As you can see, this place is looking picturesque already. Plus, I may or may not have hidden a little cabin for Bob Ross somewhere in the biome, but I'll let you guys discover that for yourselves when the download releases in a couple months. And that's our blank canvas primed and ready for our largest village yet. Let's get planning. Now, obviously, everything in the USW is completely fictional. So we took the opportunity to combine some inspirations and create a fantasy village with a bunch of features, including lots of house variants and profession buildings, a grand feasting hall, a stave church and graveyard, giant rune stones, a large war horn, 
walls, watchtowers and ballistas, and a network of fire braziers leading to the coastal outpost. Well, <laughs> I've given myself a ridiculous amount to do, so we better get into it. Just like I always do, I planned out the village with wool to make sure that the layout worked nicely. As you can see, there is a lot going into this village and a lot of thought went into it. One of the trickiest parts of these kind of projects is working out exactly where you want things to be. So making a plan like this is a real lifesaver. Plus, <laughs> it's super satisfying to watch afterwards. So with the plan complete, I set out our vanilla houses ready for their upgrades and then got to work on eight different house designs. And these are literally just the smaller buildings. I really wanted to make sure that this village had lots of variation. Sometimes it makes sense to paste in a similar variety of buildings to create a more uniform looking village, but it really depends on the type of community that you're thinking up. This village plays host to a lively bunch known as the Fafnir clan. If you're into mythology, you may recognize our inspiration for the name. In Norse mythology, Fafnir is a dwarf who turned on his family in pursuit of treasures, turning into a ferocious dragon to guard his riches. Similarly, the Fafnir clan are actually a villager-pillager hybrid turned on a subrace of their own people, the dwarves. That's right, the USW's dwarves who now live underground in their deep dark city were previously a part of the Fafnir clan. But in contrast to the Norse myth of Fafnir, it was the humans of the clan who got greedy and turned on their dwarven counterparts. Anyhow, now that I've given you guys the first of many snippets of lore, you can see that I've settled on a building style that sort of combines fantasy, medieval and viking elements. I had a blast adding all of the little details, like the dragon heads in the peaks of the curved rooftops and the decorative banners lining the walls. It was a really fun challenge creating these houses on a smaller scale, although I'd love to do some more large scale fantasy medieval builds in the future. And with all of these houses built, it's time to place them in. I love all of the little details in these buildings. They make a great start to the village and it's already coming to life. Next, I tackled the place of worship for this biome, which was inspired by a Nordic stave church. Now, as you guys know, we've tried really hard to include lots of different cultures and places of worship throughout the series. If you haven't seen your favorite yet, then we'll try to cover it in our next Ultimate Survivor World. Anyway, you might be wondering why we took inspiration from the stave church. Well, as you can see, it's an extremely interesting building to look at. Plus, it ties into these Nordic roots that we've been so inspired by. In fact, we've created a sort of hybrid religion for this biome, which also draws on elements of Old Norse paganism, as well as Viking culture. One of the things Steph and I enjoy most about this project is appreciating different cultures and beliefs while creating something fictional. We learned so much in the process, and this building was really fun to create, particularly on a diagonal axis. With that iconic tiered exterior complete, I got to work on the inside decorating the interior with some simple seating, lighting and pulpit to wrap things up before setting the building in place at the back of the village. As you can see, it's a real statement piece. Next to our place of worship, I quickly whipped up a graveyard on the other side of the river. This was another choice inspired by Norse mythology, as the river known as Ugjul is said to separate the living from the dead. Moving on to something a little bit more cheery, I made a start to the Grand Feasting Hall, where the Fafnir clan would gather for banquets and answer to their leader and mightiest shield maiden, Queen Lagatha. She's also inspired by a Viking legend, which tells tales of her as both warrior and ruler of what we know now as Norway. And so, with the exterior complete, I hopped inside to create an epic banquet hall and of course a throne for Queen Lagatha, adding lots of decorations to liven things up. I set the feasting hall in place and made some alterations to the surrounding area, adding some staircases and bridges to connect up pathways and make things accessible. As you can see, the Fafnir clan enjoy many a feast in their grand feasting hall. Wait, hang on a second. Is that Thor pleading with Clean Lagatha? I think he must have stepped into the wrong filming set today. Next up, it's the Fisherman's House. And as you can see, I decided to make the most of these buildings on a diagonal. I clearly love to torture myself with extra work. Anyway, obviously our clan lives in a pretty harsh environment, so they can't easily grow crops. Instead, they keep a lot of livestock and do lots of fishing, keeping their equipment and supplies in this building, where they also prepare the fish for the local market. 
And that's our next profession building complete. I'm loving the mini Viking rowboats. If only vanilla Minecraft boats looked more like this. So we're now moving on to the weaponsmith, which actually became a bit of a mixture of professions. What can I say? This particular villager has many talents. Some of the Minecraft professions really fit nicely with one another. So I decided to make this building a sort of weaponsmith toolsmith hybrid. I also included a banner design out front to sort of look like two swords. They kind of look like scissors actually, but maybe this villager is also the local hairdresser. Who knows? And with our multi-talented villager's house complete, I pasted it down. This place looks pretty cool actually. I might just have to pay this villager a visit when I'm next in need of a haircut. Another profession combo I thought suited each other nicely was the leather worker and armorer. As I mentioned before, the clan keeps lots of livestock and they've got to wrap up to keep warm in the harsh winters. So they take their leather and wool to the villager who lives here. And so I finished up the leather worker and armorer building by incorporating a cloth canopy, as I wanted to somehow indicate that this villager essentially makes the whole clan's clothes. And with our second combo profession building done, I placed it down and created a little market square containing lots of stalls and a tiny axe wielding Viking statue in the middle of the fountain. Next up, it's time for the longhouse. Taking further inspiration from the Vikings, I decided to build a longhouse instead of a farm, since the Vikings often keep their animals inside with them rather than having a designated barn building. So I created this whole shape where the Fafnir clan can snuggle up to their animal buddies during the cold nights. So I finished up the longhouse and set it down before making a start on the village's sacred worship sites, the giant rune stones. Inspired by the practices of Norse paganism, Steph and I thought that it'd be a really cool addition to have a few rune sites around the village etched with various Viking runes, symbolizing aspects of life that the Fafnir clan deemed most important. We included runes for protection, joy and luck, and I'll give you guys the challenge for translating the rest for yourselves. You may also have spotted the symbol of Gungnir, the Spear of Odin, another Norse mythology reference, and a nod to the dwarves of the USW, who forged the Fafnir clan's most powerful weapons. Obviously our clan needs a little more protection than just their rune stones, so I had to create some watchtowers which will later be connected by a large wall surrounding the entire village. And you may remember me mentioning that the clan trained dragons to fight alongside them, and they weren't the only race in the north with backup. Without spoiling too much of the next chapter, let's just say the Fafnir clan was forced to weaponize its border with ballistas to defend against threats of the giant winged variety. The War of the Dragons was a bloodbath, and that may just explain the giant dragon skull left behind in the savannah. Anyway, I moved on to decorations, creating a berry bush patch, a pumpkin wagon, a small cart, a bench, and some fire braziers to light everything up. I then redesigned Minecraft's village bell as a giant war horn, ready to warn the villagers of danger approaching over the mountain. And of course the horn is functional, so you can annoy the poor Fafnir villagers to your heart's content. And so, to finalize the main village, Steph and I placed hundreds of decorations throughout the area, pasting in trees and rocks, setting up the market square with shops, placing the pumpkin wagons, custom berry bushes, barrel piles, and more. Meanwhile, I finished up the exterior wall, adding in the watchtowers and connecting things up with a walkway for the patrolling guards. And finally, I added some more runes to the four banners on the watchtowers, which I'll leave for you guys to translate and let me know if you've worked out their meaning in the comments. Then I added in the front gate, which just about wraps up the main village of our Fafnir clan. Now since the Fafnir clan's factions are separated by a mountain range, I thought what better way to send a signal than a network of fire braziers in a similar fashion to the warning beacons of Gondor from Lord of the Rings. And so with our beacons built, I positioned them throughout the mountainscape connected with a rocky pathway, winding between the mountains and towards the coastal outpost. 
Now, while this area is connected to the main village, it functions as its pillager outpost counterpart. This is where the clan set sail to explore and pillage distant lands. So we're going to include the main outpost tower that also functions as a lighthouse and some cliffside housing for the pillagers. We're going to include the large fisherman building that we previously created for all of our local fishermen, a network of several docks lined with several fishing boats and of course, some classic Viking longboats to really complete our harbor. If you guys have been subscribed to the channel for a while, you may remember my PewDiePie world transformation. Well, I nabbed the longboat design I created for that, making some updates including a symbol on the sail inspired by the Vegvisia, an Icelandic stave said to guide travellers through rough weather. With lots left to do, Steph and I got to work on the coastal outpost, where the Fafnir clan start all of their pillaging excursions. I placed in the fisherman's house design from the main village and set up a small dock, added some stilted houses to the mountains and made some pathways to connect everything. I then added some platforms, built some piers and added some houses near the coastline. Meanwhile, Steph added some trees and decorations around until we eventually turned to the pillager outpost itself. Now you may remember me transforming the pillager tower earlier in this series and using the same structure for each outpost, making alterations based on the biome's theme. So I took one of the pillager towers and we made some tweaks, setting it up as a sort of lighthouse for the port. And that just about completes the Fafnir clan's coastal outpost, and I think Queen Lagatha approves. With our coastal outpost complete, it's time to make our way through the mountain range to get started on that dragon arena. This arena was where the clan would raise and train their dragons, later becoming a venue for grand sporting events. So we need to start with a large round platform featuring the symbol of Gungnir, a grandstand seating area for the village folk, a watchtower to oversee the arena, dragon training platforms to give some elevation to the dragon tamers, and a dragon nesting cave off to the side of the arena. I made a large round platform in the valley and etched in the symbol of Gungnir, which you may also remember from earlier. It is said to be associated with power, protection and authority, which is the perfect trio for our dragon arena. Steph then took some of the dragon remains from the Bone Tribe and positioned them into the ring, since this is the biome where those dragons actually resided, but we'll save all those details for the mini movie series. Meanwhile, I whipped up a basic grandstand in the rock, added a watchtower from the main village and built some platforms, which the clan trainers would use during dragon training exercises. I added some finishing touches, including of course some battle damage, while Steph built the dragon's nesting cave at the edge of the arena. And to finish off, I created a pathway into the mountains and added a giant chain left broken alongside the dragon's remains. Clearly the last dragons had a bit of a rough time. And that just about finishes off this little fighting arena. I can only imagine all the training exercises and epic battles that took place here before the dragons were wiped out. Now that the tiger transformation is all wrapped up, let's take a look at everything that we've built in this crazy transformation. And with that, the tiger biome is complete. Steph and I literally worked day and night on this. Several all nighters were pulled to get this video ready. So now that you're done with this one, make sure you continue the ultimate survival world vibes and check out the mini movie series on the Steph Block channel. Go and show us some love. Subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with the ultimate survival world. We've almost transformed every single biome. So we're finally coming close to an end. Once the USW is finished, however, the mini movie series will continue on the Steph Blocks channel. And of course you'll be able to download the map exclusively 
exclusively from my Patreon, as well as all of my other builds for both Java and Bedrock. Lastly, if you really want to stay updated between videos, then make sure you follow my Instagram and my Twitter. And you may as well join the Trixie Blocks Discord as well while you're at it. We host monthly building competitions where you can win hundreds of dollars. These videos require several weeks of work, so your support on this project has been very motivating. And I can't wait to complete the Ultimate Survival World so that you can play it for yourselves. We're so, so close. With all of that said, thank you for the love and I'll see you on the next one.